in the Christian way of looking at the world and at the human person, sin is not the last word. Sin is not the end. There is always repentance. There is always transformation. There is always newness. And this newness is made explicit in a very beautiful text in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 bring out the newness which Jesus brings. Mark gives us four indicators in verse 14 and these four indicators prepare us for the proclamation of Jesus in the next verse. The four indicators are first a time indicator and the time indicator is after John was arrested. John here refers to John the Baptist. In the first verses of Mark he was the one who came proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He was the one who baptized Jesus. He was the one whose food was described. He was the one who held center stage. But immediately after the baptism of Jesus, Mark wants to remove him from the scene and even though Mark will tell us in chapter 6 verses 14 to 29 of the arrest, imprisonment and death of John the Baptist then, the reason why he removes him effectively from the scene now is to leave only one central figure Jesus. So when there are two figures, John and Jesus, and when John is arrested and therefore removed from the scene, our attention is focused on Jesus. So the time indicator which Mark gives us is the arrest of John the Baptist. The second indicator is a place indicator. Jesus came into Galilee. In the Gospel of Mark, Galilee is not merely a geographical location. Galilee is home for Jesus. Galilee is the place where the kingdom is proclaimed, where miracles are worked, where Jesus is accepted. And you might translate the word Galilee, the place Galilee, to mean your own heart, your own vicinity, the place where you reside, the place where you work, the place where you are at this moment. Let that be your Galilee. So Jesus comes into this Galilee of yours. The third indicator which Mark gives us is a form indicator. And the form is proclamation. Mark doesn't say teaching, he says proclamation. How is proclamation different from teaching? To proclaim means to state what one knows to be a fact. To state the truth in unambiguous terms. To state what one believes with one's heart. 
So there is no explication like in teaching. There is no explanation like in teaching. There is only the statement of fact. So Jesus comes proclaiming. Jesus comes making this statement of fact. And the fourth indicator is the content indicator. And the content is that it is the Evangelion to say you. The Evangelion to say you is the good news of God. The good news of God can mean either the good news about God, but it can also mean the good news that God has asked Jesus to proclaim. So it can mean the good news about who God is. What kind of a God do we have in Jesus? But it can also mean the word of God. God's proclamation to the world. And because this proclamation is such an important proclamation, Mark uses the whole of verse 14 only to prepare our minds and our hearts for the actual proclamation. And then in verse 15, Jesus begins this proclamation. And in a very summary form, the proclamation reads thus. The kingdom of God is here. Repent. The text does say, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe in the good news. But the entire proclamation may simply be summarized in these words. The kingdom of God is here. Repent. Now it is extremely important to notice the placement of the words. The text does not say repent then the kingdom of God will be here. No. The text does not put repentance as a condition. Rather, repentance is the consequence of the kingdom's arrival. Repentance is after the kingdom comes. Repentance follows the sprouting up of the kingdom. So you might say that in his proclamation, Jesus speaks about an indicative, the kingdom coming, the arrival of the kingdom, the kingdom's presence, the kingdom is now followed by, followed by the imperative. So the imperative follows the indicative. And this is extremely important for our understanding both of Jesus and about the God whom Jesus reveals to us today. I find it so disheartening when I come across people who do not believe that they are first loved. When I come across people who try to earn or merit God's love, and I say, no, no matter how holy you might be, no matter how close to God you think you may be, you can never, never merit or earn God's love because it has been given freely. It has been given without cost. It has been given without counting. 
it has been given even when we were sinners. So the proclamation of Jesus translated in today's language would mean this. God loves you. The kingdom is here. God accepts you. The kingdom is here. God pardons you. The kingdom is here. God forgives you. Therefore, as a consequence, as a result, because God loves you, accept God's love. Because God forgives you, accept God's forgiveness. Because God accepts you, accept God's acceptance. Jesus' proclamation is not, if you are good, God will love you. If you are sinless, God will love you. No, the proclamation of Jesus is, God loves you therefore be good the proclamation of Jesus is God forgives you therefore forgive and do not sin so not sinning or being sinless is not the condition for the forgiveness of God it is the result the consequence because I feel such powerful, such unconditional, such magnanimous love, because I feel this, I'm able to accept it by loving in return. I'm able to accept it by forgiving in return. I'm able to accept it by accepting in return. 1 John 4.10 The first letter of John Chapter 4, verse 10 says, The truth is this, not that we loved God. No, the truth is that God loved us first. And even when we were sinners. My dear friend, if out of this whole talk of mine, you have only got this one point, namely, God loved you first, and that is why you love in return. If you only are able to believe in your heart that God forgives you, and that is why you forgive, it will be enough. The scriptures, the words of Jesus, are filled with this proclamation. And therefore, we need that new mind. Because metanoia, translated into English as repentance, is made up of two Greek words. Meta, which is beyond, and nous, which is the mind. So metanoia, literally, Truly means a new mind. And I believe in order to accept this novel proclamation of Jesus, in order to believe like Jesus wants us to believe that we are loved unconditionally and even when we are sinners, we'll need this new mind, this new heart, this new way of looking. And so, in order to aid this reflection, in order to help you to look at yourself as loved, I direct you to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. A parable found only in the Gospel of Luke and often called the parable of the prodigal son. However, it is not so much about the prodigality of the son 
as it is about the prodigality of the father. The son is prodigal. The son is a waster. The son is lavish. The son is a spendthrift only with material wealth. The real prodigal in the story is the father. Because the father is prodigal, is a spendthrift, is lavish, is wasteful with his love. This is the image of God that Jesus reveals. And I pray that this image of God will come to you in your Galilee, in your heart, so that you will experience this deep forgiveness, this deep love, this deep acceptance, this deep pardon, and you will be able to accept and love and forgive and pardon in turn.